We're an extremely profitable company. Essentially every frame of this video, everything you see and everything you hear in this video has passed through Adobe software. This is me making animations in After Effects. This is me editing some of the vector graphics in Adobe Illustrator. This is me editing the voiceover in Adobe Edition. And this is me editing some of the pictures in Adobe Photoshop. And this is me editing the video in Adobe Premiere. So without exaggerating, Adobe is for digital creative work, a bit like Google is for online search. Whereas Microsoft Office at least used to be for all types of office work. A few weeks ago, this company, Adobe, announced that they are acquiring a company called Figma for $20 billion. It's the biggest ever acquisition of a private software company. Something like a $20 billion tech deal definitely is, is something that people are paying attention to. This acquisition has attracted a lot of attention, not only because of the hefty price tag, but also because many expect that the merger could face some opposition from antitrust regulators. So I'm an antitrust lawyer and I originally started to make videos like this to talk about how under-enforced and how weak our antitrust laws are in most parts of the world. I've now made several videos about that and my plan was to focus a bit also on other topics but the Adobe Figma merger hits a little bit too close to home for me to not say anything about it. This is Adobe. It's a giant corporation with around $16 billion in annual revenues. Adobe owns a huge number of software programs. I've already mentioned a few of them, like After Effects, the software that I use to make this very animation. Adobe sells almost all of its software tools as a huge, really expensive bundle called Creative Cloud. And some reports say that Adobe has some 26 million paying Creative Cloud customers. That Adobe sells its products in a bundle is important. And if you watch this video to the end, you will understand why. This is Figma. In comparison with Adobe, Figma is a small company with some $400 million in revenues that are all generated from only one product, a web-based product development program. Figma was launched in 2016 and has become hugely popular. Some say they have around 4 million users worldwide, even though presumably many of those customers use the free version of Figma. Adobe also launched a product development software in 2016. It's called XD. XD hasn't performed nearly as well as Figma. And a few weeks ago, Adobe admitted defeat and announced that it's buying Figma for $20 billion. So to be honest, I usually can't understand big numbers unless I put them in a context. So let's do that with the 20 billion price tag. $20 billion is 50 times Figma's annual revenues. Not Figma's profits, it's revenues. $20 billion is $5,000 per Figma user. And $20 billion is 20 times more than Facebook paid for Instagram, 12 times more than Google paid for YouTube, and 10 times more than Google paid for Fitbit. Having tried it out, I get why it's popular. It's like Illustrator meets Google Docs in a super accessible package. But still, $20 billion? Why is Adobe paying this much to acquire a smallish company with only one product? I will get back to that question, but first, I want to give you a two-minute explanation of what antitrust law and merger control law is. The whole idea with a market economy is that companies should compete with each other. Because when companies compete, a number of benefits are supposed to follow. Resources are allocated efficiently, prices are pressured, and quality is improved. This is, in a nutshell, Adam Smith's invisible hand. Competition explains how greed, in Gordon Gekko's words, sometimes can be good for society. The flip side of all of this, and something that is often forgotten, is that a market economy will not deliver those benefits for society when there is no competition. Without competition, there is no invisible hand, and greed is not good at all. So to make sure that we have competition, we have antitrust laws. 
Antitrust law makes it illegal for the companies that are supposed to compete to agree not to compete, either through a cartel agreement or through an anti-competitive merger. And in order to decide which mergers are anti-competitive and which are not, there is this complex subgenre of antitrust law called merger control law. Merger control law forces big companies to ask the authorities for approval before they are allowed to merge. Such merger control laws that force companies to ask for approval before they merge, they exist in almost every country. And for a big merger like this one, Adobe will most likely need to get approval in a number of jurisdictions around the world. So what's happening right now is that Adobe's top dollar merger control lawyers at the law firm Skadden are asking the antitrust authorities in a number of jurisdictions around the world for approval to merge with Figma. And what the antitrust authorities have to decide before they can give approval is whether the merger is anti-competitive or not. How the authorities should approach that question, the question whether a merger is anti-competitive or not, is an increasingly complex and controversial question. Traditionally, many authorities have adopted a pretty narrow approach to this question. A narrow approach where the key issue is whether the merging parties today are competing within the same market. If you use this traditional narrow approach to the Adobe Figma deal, you would probably find that Adobe and Figma today have only a minor product overlap. Figma is strong among product developers, but Adobe's product for product development, XD, is pretty weak. So weak that the authorities, if they use a traditional narrow approach, probably could approve the transaction unconditionally. However, many argue that this narrow approach to merger control misses what many mergers today are all about. Because if you look at the price Adobe is paying for Figma, it's obvious that Adobe is paying for something more than just the product development software that Figma has today. Adobe probably wouldn't pay $20 billion for just that. So again, what is Adobe paying for? To understand that, we have to take another important detour. We have to talk about creative destruction. Adobe today commands an impressive empire of powerful software. You know, we're an extremely profitable company. An empire that enables Adobe to charge the monopoly prices that I have to pay in order to make this video. You could think that antitrust laws would condemn monopolies like Adobe and the monopoly prices that they probably charge, but that's not the case. In the antitrust paradigm we currently live, it's considered okay that companies like Adobe enjoy some monopoly-like power. Why? Because the assumption is that this type of monopoly is both temporary and it spurs innovation. This assumption is based on the Austrian economist Joseph Schumpeter's growth theory. According to this theory, companies that come up with new superior technologies should be able to take over a whole market and should be allowed to charge monopoly prices. At least for a little while until other companies catch up or until another company comes up with an even more superior technology that can take over the market. Schumpeter called these shifts creative destruction. And history is full of examples of creative destruction. Blockbuster used to dominate the movie rental business in the USA, then a company called Netflix came along. We used to have huge record stores in all cities, like Tower Records, then Spotify came along. That's how Schumpeterian growth is supposed to work. Firms innovate to win temporary market power. That's also the premise that the current antitrust paradigm is built on. Schumpeter's assumptions explain why we don't break up monopolies. But what we've seen over the last 20 years is that many companies, especially big tech companies like Facebook, Google and Amazon, seems to be more or less immune to Schumpeterian competition. They've been able to not only protect but also strengthen their monopolies despite seismic technological shifts. And the way these companies have protected themselves is not by innovation, but by building what Warren Buffett famously refers to as moats. And they've been able to build these moats with the help of two anti-competitive tools that our antitrust laws have done little to prevent. Exclusionary tactics and killer acquisitions. One example of an exclusionary tactic that monopolies use to protect themselves is to bundle a lot of different products. 
So the customers are directly or indirectly forced to buy the whole bundle and then become less likely to try the products of other companies. And the other tool, killer acquisitions, is what monopolies use when exclusionary tactics prove insufficient to eliminate a threat. With a killer acquisition, the monopoly simply pays for the innovative threat to disappear. Exclusionary tactics and killer acquisitions are two tools that complement each other. First, monopolies deploy exclusionary tactics to inflict damage on all companies that try to enter the market. And if they do that effectively, it later becomes cheaper to use the killer acquisition tool if they have to. So now that we've made that detour, we can return to the question, what is Adobe actually paying 20 billion dollars for? Adobe has been extremely successful in using exclusionary tactics such as bundling to maintain its empire. You know we're an extremely profitable company and what we have said is we have some aggressive goals. But this empire is built on a desktop foundation. It's built by software programs that are installed locally on the user's computers and are meant to be used by only one user at the time. Figma's tools, on the other hand, are completely web-based and can be used by several persons at the same time. And everyone seems to agree that web-based and collaborative tools are the future also for the digital creative programs that make up Adobe's desktop empire. And what Adobe fears is that Figma will be able to use its superior web-based and collaborative platform as a base to piece by piece creatively destruct Adobe's desktop software empire. And Adobe is now paying 20 billion dollars for that threat to go away. The antitrust authorities around the world have for too long let dominant companies like Adobe get away with exclusionary tactics and killer acquisitions. And this laissez-faire approach has had severe consequences. Market power is on the rise across the globe. Researchers have found that the most powerful firms today are able to charge dramatically higher markups and make much higher profits than they used to be. And this is a trend that is beneficial to the owners of the most powerful companies, but it's detrimental to innovation, it's detrimental to workers and to consumers. The increase in market power of a few powerful firms is one of the reasons for why wages have stagnated despite the fact that productivity has kept going up. I believe there's overwhelming evidence that the promise of Champitri in competition has been oversold. I'm still on the fence as to whether we need to start breaking up some of the most powerful companies, but I do know that we need to do something to tackle increasing market power. And the bare minimum we can do is to use the antitrust rules that are already in place in most countries in the world. We can use them to stop the most powerful companies from engaging in exclusionary tactics and killer acquisitions. And I believe that that includes that Adobe should be blocked from buying Figma. So I got a really funny comment the other day from someone who said that they love the videos I post on the market exit, but that he cannot support me on Patreon because he cannot endorse all of my opinions that I express on this channel. So I just want to clarify, if you want to support my channel and want to help me make more videos like the one you just saw, then you can go to patreon.com slash the market exit and become a Patreon. And that does not mean that you also endorse all of the opinions I express on this channel, just the same way Buying the New York Times doesn't mean that you endorse everything Paul Krugman, for example, writes. If you want to know more about the rise of market power also and what consequences that has for society, then I can really recommend uh, The Economist John Eckhout's book, The Profit Paradox. It's one of the best books I read this year. It's both readable and convincing, and I would say that you don't have to be an antitrust lawyer or an economist to enjoy it at all. I also want to recommend Matt Stoller's substack called uh, Big. Matt is a great writer and he's a fierce anti-monopolist and he has uh, on his blog published a feedback form where people who actually use Adobe's and Figma software, they can submit comments about the Adobe Figma merger. I think that was it. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.